hey thank you very much for clicking on this video and watching this video remember to become a vip member by subscribing to the channel and also join me every single weekday 4 p.m or 1600 gmt on the business lecturer in within show as i teach you live and ask you uh questions and answer any questions that you are having so click the subscribe button and become a vip member remember to follow me as well on instagram at insura premium enjoy the video all right so let's look at ifrs 16 leases what we said was that uh when it comes to ifrs 16 leases it's a standard that is replacing uh the iis 17 you knew already under the lease and it became effective last year 2019 and what happens is that under iis 17 how lease was accounted for was different. One key thing was that under IAS 17, it is the lessee that is going to classify the lease into whether it is an operating lease or a finance lease. And the benchmark for the classification was to meet a certain requirement. Like for instance, the present value of the minimum lease payment is almost equal to the fair value of what? The assets. So if for instance the asset is $30,000 and I'm leasing it for 10 years and the money I'm paying when we discount it is around $26,500, that means the asset is almost mine, so it becomes what? A finance lease. Another thing is if there will be transfer of um, title at the end of the lease term. So maybe it's not up to it, I'm leasing it for only $15,000. But at the end of the lease term, I will now own that particular asset. Then the lessee will classify it as a finance lease. Another thing was, if there is a purchase bargaining uh, power or option, which means at the end of the lease term, the lessee can buy back the asset at an amount below what it fair value. That's another option. And then um, the lease term is almost close to the economic useful life of the asset. So if the asset this full life is 30 years and I'm leasing it for 25 years, it's more or less like what? It's my asset. So if this, any of these is met, then the lessee was to classify the lease as what? A finance lease. Any other thing there, he must classify it as what? An operating lease. So if nothing is here, then he classifies it as an operating lease. So we realize that under IAS 17, a lot of items are not recognized on the face of the financial statements because um, a company can lease an asset, it's an operating lease, but they may treat it as what? A finance lease. Or it's a finance lease, but to prevent the liability from appearing in the statement of financial position, they may be recognizing it as what? An operating lease, which doesn't show the true uh, picture or the true and fair view of the entity. So to solve some of these matters, that is why IFRS 17 was what? Uh, sorry, IFRS 16 was developed to solve some of what? These issues. Now, under IFRS 16, the lessee is not the one that classified the lease as to whether it is what? An operating lease or a finance lease. All the lessee does is to recognize right of use of an asset. ROU right of use of an asset. So you're not going to be classifying the lease into it's, it's an operating system. No, all you do is you recognize the right of use of an asset. Now, once you are recognizing right of use of an asset, so this is about initial recognition. You go recognize right of use of the asset. At the same time, you recognize the lease what? Liability. So you recognize the right of use of the asset, you recognize again the lease liability. Now, so what is the right of use of an asset? Like the name suggests, uh, permission that we have received to what? Use the asset in our business. So as far as the lessor, the lessor has given us the asset and we are now using the asset in our business, we have to recognize what? The right of use of an asset. So the question we then ask ourselves is, okay, what should constitute the right of use of an asset? Now remember, even though I have said that the lessee and the IFRS 16 recognizes straight the right of use of an asset, 
there is an election that, or there is an option they have that they may decide not to recognize what? The rights of use of an asset. Rather, uh, there are two ways or conditions, alternative options available for them. For instance, there is what is called the low value option. This is where if the entity leaves an asset and the value of the asset is low, then they will not what? Go through the headache of IFRS 16. They will just recognize it as what? An operating lease. So for instance, they lease a computer. I mean, you don't, you don't go and do the long things we'll be doing later on. It's what? A low value asset. Or the lease is less than 12 months. Then they can what? Classify it as an operating lease. So these are the two options available. If the entity concludes that this is a low value asset, then they can decide to what? Account for it as an operating lease. Or if the lease term is less than 12 months, then they can decide to account for it as what? An operating lease. Now, if they choose that option, it means that they are going to be recognizing the lease on what? A straight line basis. Does it make sense? Yeah. And charge the same amount on an annual basis. So, for instance, they lease a computer for 12 months, or maybe they lease a computer which is $1,000 for two years. It's simple. You don't have to recognize rights of use, lease obligation, that be all the entity does is that okay, what is the annual lease payment we are going to pay? Simple. That will be thousand divided by two, and that will be five hundred. Thousand divided by two, so five hundred, and that five hundred will be treated in the income statement as what well, your expenses. Are you getting the idea? So these are the two alternative available. If it's a low value asset, we may go straight and recognize it as an operating lease. But or if the lease is less than twelve months, we may recognize it also as what well, an operating lease. So in other words, the operating lease. Virtually, is using the straight line method. Mm -hmm. Yes, with a straight line method. So whatever amount you pay, you just spread it equally for the period that you have used it in the year ended. So let's go to the real issue here and let's look at the lessee accounting and let's find out the details about that. So I have already said that on the initial recognition, the lessee recognize what? A right of use of an asset and recognize a lease liability. So, for double entry purposes, what do we see? We debit right of use and credit what? A lease liability. But a big question we ask ourselves is, what should constitute the value for the right of use of the asset? So let's look at some of the things there. So, the right of use of an asset is measured at is measured at the amount of liability the amount of lease liability ll is lease liability plus any initial direct cost incurred by the lessor by the lessee sorry the right of use is measured at the amount of the lease liability plus any initial direct cost incurred by the lessee. So what do we mean then? One, the lease liability will come. Two, any initial direct cost that we incur. Three, any estimated dismantling cost from IAS 16. Dismantling cost. And then four, payment less any incentive. Less incentives before commencement date. Before commencement date. So these are the four things that will go into us determining what? the right of use of our assets. So the lease liability, the direct cost that we incur, the estimated cost for dismantling and what? The uh, payment less any incentive that we make. Note that 
the lease liability is always going to be present value of your minimum lease what? Payment. Okay. The, the present value of the minimum lease payment. That is, if we discount how much you are paying using the borrowing rate of the lease or the borrowing rate of the lessee, how much are we going to get for that? Then there are some machines from IS16, you remember that if we install them and we finish using them, they have to be what? Demantled. Yeah. So decommissioning cost and all of those things. If we are the ones supposed to pay it, then it has to be included in what? Determining the right of use of an asset. Then we come to the second aspect, which is the lease liability. The standard says that the lease liability is measured at the present value of the minimum lease payment payable over the lease term. Payable over the lease term. Discounted. Discounted at the rate implicit on the lease. In the lease. So the minimum lease, sorry, the lease liability, which is our credit entry here is going to be measured at the present value of the minimum lease payment over the lease term, discounted at what? The rate implicit on the lease. Now, sometimes in the, in the lease agreement, the lessor will have his own what? Interest rate implicit on the lease. Or the two, the lessor and the lessee will agree that let's use this interest rate. If that is there, then that is what we we'll use to what? Discount the cash flows. But sometimes there is no uh, interest rate implicit, uh, implicit in the lease. In that circumstance, we use the lessee's borrowing rate as the interest rate implicit in the lease. Does it make sense? So once the lease does not have its own interest rate implicit, then we use the lessee's what? borrowing rate together. So what should constitute the lease liability? Any fixed payment less incentive? Any variable payment where there is consumer price indexes in the future? Any expected residual value that is guaranteed? Expected residual value guaranteed? Penalty for terminating? And then any exercise price of purchase option if the option will be exercised. So these are what will be included in the lease liability. So the fixed payment is the annual payment we are making every year. The variable co payment could be that. It could be under the contract that for every year the lease should be the annual lease payment should be increased by 10%. That becomes what? The variable component. So if the fixed payment is ten thousand dollars per annum, but there is a condition that for time value of money purposes, every year you have to increase it by what? 10%. That means the extra thousand that will be paid every year becomes what? A variable component of it, and that will be changing throughout the lease term. Then the expected residual value that is guaranteed. That means if, for instance, the lessor is going to give us an option to buy the asset, what is the residual value that is guaranteed in the deal that he will be receiving the, that money? Then we agree on that. So if it is agreed that after 10 years, you will buy the asset at least for, say, $2,000, then that means we're going to be buying it. So since we're going to be buying it, literally we owe what? The lessor. 
That is the idea there. Then penalty for terminating the contract, if we can reasonably measure that. So for instance, sometimes you lease an asset for 10 years. The lessor has taken his mind off, thinking that in the next 10 years, he is guaranteed of a certain annual income. Then all of a sudden, you cancel the contract. So if you cancel the contract, what would be the, because he would have to wait for say two years before somebody else will come and what? Take the building. So sometimes there are penalties for what? terminating. So if you want to terminate, there are conditions where you have to inform the uh, owner a long time beforehand so the owner will be looking for what? Mm -hmm. Tenants or somebody else. Then the last thing is excise price of the purchase option. That is, uh, that this is more or less like this one. That is how much you are going to be paying. So this is the guarantee 2000 mm -hmm. But at that time, what will be the fair value of the assets? Then that will be also what? included in our discussion. So that is the idea about what goes into the determination of the lease liability. Remember, all these will be added up and discounted at what? Using the interest rate implicit uh, in the lease. Because all these are in future terms. So we need to bring them into present values. So that is the lease uh, right of use and also this. Then we go to subsequent measurements. So this is the initial recognition. Then we go to subsequent measurements. So subsequent to the initial recognition, subsequent to the initial recognition, remember, the right of use of the asset is now our asset. And we are using it. So we are going to what? Depreciate it. So right of use is depreciated on a straight line route basis. On a straight line basis. However, the useful life to be used will be the area of useful life for depreciation is the area of the economic useful life of the asset and the lease term. So, what are we saying here? Depreciation is going to be equal to the right of use divided by what? The economic useful life or the useful life. So useful life that we're going to be using for our depreciation is going to be what? The area of the economic useful life of the asset or what? The lease term. So if the useful life of the asset is 10 years and we've leased it for 5 years, then in our depreciation we use what? 5 years. Five years. That's the idea about that. But there is a condition attached to this. What is the condition? The condition is that if title will transfer at the end of the lease term, they will depreciate the assets using it what? Economic useful life. Uh, do you get that? If title is guaranteed that title will transfer at the end of the lease term, or the entity will purchase the assets at the end of the lease term, meaning after the five years, the asset will definitely become the yes. asset of the company. For that reason, we will depreciate it using what? The economic useful life of the asset. I hope you get a difference. So that is it. So in that case, we we'll use the 10 years and not what? The, the 5 years. But if that thing is not there, then we we'll always go for the earlier of the two. Because sometimes it's the useful life of an asset can be 10 years, but for some reason you can sign a lease agreement of 15 years on the assets. Mm -hmm. Thinking that maybe after the 10 years you do remodification of it. That is why we always limit it to the earlier of what? The two. Which one is the smallest? Uh, which one comes first. So that's our subsequent measurement for uh, the right of use. Then how about the lease liability? So the financial lease liability. Our financial lease liability is carried at what? Amortized cost. It's carried at amortized cost. So the financial lease liability is carried at amortized cost. 
Now, when we say amortized cost, what do we mean by that? Please note that the way the amortized cost will be done will be, depend will be dependent on the time of payment of the lease. And there are two time of payment of lease. We have what we call at the start of the year. And then also what? At the end of the year. So at the start of the year is in advance. At the end of the year is what? In arrears. Depending on how the payment is done, your schedule is going to be different. So if we are making payments in at the start of the year, so at year start, how will our schedule be? We're going to have the year here. We're going to have the balance brought forward. Then because it is at the start of the year, the installment payable will come. So the installment payment will come. Then we will get the capital balance remaining. Then we will charge an interest. And then we will get the carry forward. Okay. We are not, you are not supposed to do this line, so, but I'm just going in for my separation. So, the balance brought forward, which in the first year will be the figure we had by discounting. Then we bring the installment payments, the annual payable. When we subtract it, so year one, this comes, we deduct it, then the figure, the difference we get becomes the balance, capital balance. Then the interest here is the interest rate implicit in what? The lease. So the interest rate which we use to calculate the present value is what we are going to be using on what? The capital balance. So once we get that, we add that interest to this and we get what? The carry forward. The carry forward. But you've got to understand something as well here. When we get this carry forward, that is the lease liability closing balance. But that lease liability closing balance must be divided into current liability and what? The non-current liability. So how do we divide? How do we divide? The rule is that if payment is at the start of the year, then we do the uh, uh, amortization for one schedule. We do it for only one period. Just one period like this. Then this closing balance you see here, the annual installment, which is what you bring here, becomes the current liability. Then when we take that figure from the carry forward here, we get what? The non-current liability. Does it make sense? So, if payment is made in advance or at the start of the year, then we will do the schedule for only one period. When we do the schedule for only one period, the carry forward we get here must be split into current and non-current. How do we get that? Because the next payment would have to be made in January, we need to make provision for it at the end of the year. So that annual installment becomes what? The current liability. Then when we take that from the carry forward, so the carry forward minus the annual installment becomes what? The non-current liability. You get it, PJ. Right. So that is it about the start of the year. The start of the year. Then we come to the end of the year. If payment is done, so installments at year end or in advance, sorry, in arrears. Then for that one, we will do the schedule for two periods. We will do the schedule for two periods, but the format will be different. So we'll go here, we'll go balance brought forward. We will look at interest on the balance brought forward because we are making payments at the end. And Sana, we bring the installment, then we bring the carry forward. So you realize that if you are making payments at the end of the year, there will not be anything like capital balance. And the installment will come 
after the interest here. So, and I said, with this one, we do for two periods. But this one will do for only one period. So, year one, we'll bring our balance brought forward. The interest rate implicit on the lease, we get it. Then the annual installment payable, we subtract it. The balancing figure goes here. Now remember, I told you that carry forward must be split into current and non-current. But I had no, the way we do the split is based on the second period. So we'll do the, another period for it so that this carry forward will become brought forward here. Yeah. We will calculate interest on that. Installment is still going to be the same. They will get what? The carry value. Now, the final second period we did, that carrying value is the non-current liability. Then the difference between the first and the second is the current liability. <clears throat> the difference between the, the first and the second. And the second is the current liability. And then the last period is the non-current liability. the lease liability, ask yourself, when are we making the payment? When are we making the payment? So if the payment is at the start of the year, this is where we go. And we do for one period, and the installment, annual installment, becomes the current liability. And when we take the installment from the closing balance, that becomes what? The non-current liability. Then, if the payment is made at the end of the year, in arrears, then we will charge the interest in the opening balance or on the opening balance and then we subtract the installment and get the carry forward. Nemo, we need to do for two periods when payment is at year end. So when we go through again, the second period becomes the non-current liability. The difference between the first and the second becomes the current liability. So the big question we ask ourselves is, what comes in the income statement on the subsequent measurement of the lease? What comes in the income statement? This is very, very important. Number one, the depreciation charge. And number two, the interest expense, which is the finance lease interest. So the interest you have here, here, that's what will go into the income statement. And then for the year end, the first year interest. That's what goes into the income statement. That's the idea about that. Now, so it means the annual lease payable, that is the annual installment now with TIRO, that one doesn't come in the income statement. So the annual installment that we paid, that doesn't come in the income statement. The only thing that comes in the income statement is what? Your depreciation charge and your finance lease. Okay. This is very, very important. So that is it about how the lesser, sorry, the let's see deals with this. So let's look at a question and see how these principles make sense for us. So this is page 12, I guess. Yeah, page 12. 